Buckle your seatbelt. The Bible bus scales the heights of the majestic Old Testament book of Isaiah as we continue our exciting five-year journey through the whole Word of God. Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and if you've been with us since the start of this series, then you know the seriousness of Isaiah's message to a corrupt government and a broken culture that tried to live apart from God. Last time, Dr. McGee quoted a memorable list about man's search for answers apart from God. Let me read that for you again. Philosophy says, think your way out. Indulgence says, drink your way out. Politics says, spend your way out. Science says, invent your way out. Industry says, work your way out. Militarism says, fight your way out. The Bible says, pray your way out. But Jesus Christ says, I am the way out. Isn't that great? We saw in our study that after the Lord brings his charges against Judah, he offers them salvation and a way out of their trouble. Jesus still offers that way out to you and me today. So if you're tired of trying and failing to find a way out of your troubles, I invite you to turn to Jesus. Follow him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Recently, we received this letter from a listener in India who wrote to tell us of his surrender. I live in a village in Uttar Pradesh. Currently, I am 14 years old. Recently, my parents were very anxious about me because I was making a lot of bad choices. During this time, I happened to attend a Christian fellowship near our house. As I sat and listened, I felt something begin in me. In the days that followed, I was more peaceful and satisfied with life. Someone suggested I begin to tune into your programs. I did as he asked and found it very meaningful. I finally understood the change that was taking place inside. To think that I used to believe that only after taking a bath in the river Ganga would I receive redemption of sins, your teaching explained that Jesus has taken all our sins on the cross of Calvary by sacrificing himself on the cross. Since then, I started believing in Jesus Christ, and I have accepted him as my Savior and Lord. Seeing the change in me, my whole family began to listen to your programs. They have also accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Well, isn't that amazing? And then here's one more letter that I know you're going to love. It's from a listener of our Lugandan language program. That's in Uganda, Africa. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior during the lessons in Romans, and I am now free. God's Word encourages and strengthens me. Every day I feel I have new hope in my life. The way you teach the Bible gives real details and actions that I can take. Thank you. Let's pray for these listeners, as well as for anyone else who's turning to Jesus right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that we find in your Son, Jesus, and we would ask for courage and strength for those who have come to the end of themselves and are turning to you. Thank you, Lord, for mercy and grace available to us at our first cry for help. Open our eyes now to the wonders of your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're off to Isaiah 1 and 2 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we come back today to Isaiah And we are going to take chapter 2. Now, somebody says, but you didn't finish chapter 1. Well, we got the main message from chapter 1. God having brought his charge against his people after he'd hailed them into court, he now offers them a redemption, a salvation, a wonderful way out. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. And God says today that the invitation is still open because if you come to his son, he says, him that cometh to me, the Lord Jesus made that statement, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now the Lord continues on here gently and yet with a warning in this chapter. He says, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, those two aspects are in Isaiah. We have the government of God, and we have the grace of God emphasized. And the first section has to do with the government of God. Now, during the remainder of this chapter, why God is attempting to woo them back to himself, but also he's giving them the warning. And he says, verse 24, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will rid myself 
of mine adversaries and avenge myself of mine enemies. And I will turn my hand upon thee and thoroughly purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at the first. And he said, afterward thou shalt be called a city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her converts with righteousness. But he goes on to say, and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. You see, there's the warning there also. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. Now, that has to do with idolatry. The idols were put under the oak trees, and around them a garden was planted. He says, For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water, and the strong shall be as a wick, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. We feel like today that God has been misrepresented in the sense that he loses his temper, and that he breaks forth and judgment and flails away upon his people. That's never the picture. The picture is that your sin is like a wick. And when you continue in sin, why, the judgment comes of itself. That sin brings upon itself that judgment. And you remember the Lord Jesus made the statement in his day that the spark and the fire would come and destroy. It naturally follows. If you're going to put the spark of sin, the fire will follow. Or be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Now we come to chapter 2, and we have here a prophecy concerning the last days and the kingdom and the great tribulation period. And we begin in chapter 2 and go through chapter 5, and that constitutes actually one prophecy. That means that you have in this section here two, three, four, and five. In four chapters, we have one great prophecy, and it concerns the nation Israel in the last days. And I'd like for you to notice something here that's very important. He says that it concerns Judah and Jerusalem. And I think he's including, as he makes it clear as we move on down, that he is speaking of all of the 12 tribes of Israel. God thought of them as one, and he intends for all 12 tribes to be brought back together again. And so what you have here is a prophecy concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And we're not talking about the church. There's no way in the world of making this applicable to the church. To begin with, Paul says that the church was a great mystery, you remember. And now that it's being revealed that God today is bringing a message to the world through the church, but the church is to be removed from the world. And this looks beyond the time of the church and looks to the day when God will begin to move in a new way. And that is the great tribulation period. And that will be the time that he sets up his kingdom at the end of the great tribulation period. Now, Paul makes that clear over in Romans 16, verse 25. He says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now, if Isaiah knew about it, then it was not new for the apostles and the early church and for the church today. It's not something new, but it actually is something that was back in the Old Testament. But I trust that we will use enough common sense in the prophets now to understand that when he speaks of Judah and Israel and Jerusalem, that he happens to be talking about these literal places, 
And if he's going to use figures of speech, which he will, he'll make it perfectly clear, the scripture will, that these are figures of speech. And so I think we ought to understand that very well. Now we can add something else to it. In verse 2, he says, Now it shall come to pass in the last days. Now don't again say that these are the last days of the church. The last days of the church pertain to the time of a spiritual apostasy. Paul makes that very clear when he's writing to a young preacher in the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now the latter times of the church and here the last days of Israel are not identical. They're not contemporary. They are not synonymous. They overlap, but certainly they do not refer to the same period of time, and it's important to see that. Now, the last days begin with the great tribulation period. The Lord Jesus Christ makes that very clear when they ask him, when shall these things be, the destruction of Jerusalem? He reached down and put his finger down on the last days and called it the Great Tribulation Period. Now, the Great Tribulation Period ends by the coming of Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. And it shall come to pass now in the last days. We're in a period in this area here from chapter 2 through chapter 5 that deals with the Great Tribulation Period and the kingdom that is to be set up on this earth. Now it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Now that's very important to see. The last days now and the mountain. Now in the last days, we want to make it very clear again that we're speaking of a day that is coming in the future, and it pertains to the nation Israel after the church is removed. Now, a mountain in Scripture means a kingdom or an authority or a rule. Now, Daniel makes that clear in his prophecy. In Daniel 2.35, I'll not turn to that, but he makes it clear and in Revelation 17.9, Revelation 13.1, that what we're speaking of now is a kingdom, if you please, an authority. Now it shall come to pass in the last days that the kingdom of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, that is, above all the kingdoms of this earth. Now that's the thing that we're told, that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll be king of kings and lord of lords. Now we're looking to that. One of the reasons that the little nation of Israel is in such a hot spot today, that is the most sensitive piece of real estate because that's the very spot God has chosen which will be the political center and the religious center of this world during the kingdom. He makes that very clear here. And many nations, not many, but all nations shall flow unto it. Now we are told, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the kingdom of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Both government and religion will center in Jerusalem, and the Lord Jesus, we're told, is to sit on the throne of David. Now, that was made very clear even in the New Testament that the Lord Jesus will sit upon the throne of David. Now we're told here, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And now the period of the reign of Christ on the earth in the millennium is a period of judgment it's another trial period for mankind, and there will be a great many judged during that period, 
And, of course, multitudes will be saved during that period. Now he says, verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now, this is a verse of Scripture, and it's very clear that it's only during the kingdom that they'll be able to beat their swords into plowshares. In fact, Joel makes it very clear that at the time of the Great Tribulation, that, that'll be reversed. They are going to beat plowshares into swords. And by the way, we're living in that period today. This idea of disarming a nation and disarming individuals is, to my judgment, contrary to the Word of God. The Lord Jesus said, A strong man armed keepeth his house. You want to have peace? You're going to have to have law and order. Now, you may not like that expression, but you're going to have to have it. You're going to have peace and safety in this world today. And long as you and I are living in a big, bad world, it's well that a strong man armed keepeth his house. Now, this is a prophecy that will be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus is reigning on this earth. And when he's reigning in Jerusalem, you'll be able to take the locks off your doors, you'll be able to walk the streets at night in safety, and you'll not be drafted, there'll be war no more, and you can beat your swords into plowshares. And in that day, you won't need to get rid of the guns because the Lord Jesus is going to get rid of them. There won't be any need for them whatsoever. This is the kingdom that he's going to establish on this earth. He is the Prince of Peace. Now, it's almost futile today. It's almost nonsensical. It's asinine today for any man. It doesn't make any difference about what party he belongs to or what nation he comes from, when he promises that there will be peace on the earth and that men can make peace. Someone has said that the United Nations founded to bring peace on the earth is the greatest place to carry on a battle. And it is proven how impotent it is that it cannot bring peace to the earth. It only has increased dictatorship upon the earth. And we do not have peace today. I'm not entering into any political argument. What I'm trying to say is that if you're a child of God and you get your thinking cap on and begin to think God thoughts after him, you'll find out that you're living in a big, bad, evil world. And if you think that we're living in a world when you're going to have the brotherhood of man and all that type of thing, absolutely that you are entirely wrong because man is not going to be able to bring peace on this earth. Man is not even capable of bringing peace on this earth. Now, let's move on down. And he shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And that will not come as long as sin is in the heart of man and man with overweening ambition want to rule over other people. That is today actually a horrible thing of one man ruling over man, wanting to be the one at the top. My friend, I say to you that that's the thing that brings about wars. James says that. Now he says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now in view of the future that this is coming, then today we should walk in the light of the Lord. This is the only way of peace. And when you leave God out, you'll never have peace on the earth. Now he goes on to say, therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also 
full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock, hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Now he goes on to say, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. God intends to bring down proud man proud man that thinks he can rule himself and rule the world today and leave God out. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan. I think he's speaking here of the pride of man. And then he says, and upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up. This is actually upon society and government here and upon every high tower and upon every fenced city, the military is to be judged, and upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures, commerce and art will be judged, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. All the pomp and pride of man the pomp and ceremony, all of that is to be put down and the idols shall be utterly abolished and he's going to get rid of all a false religion and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord. Now John in the book of Revelation says that when the Lord comes, that's what man will do in that day. You and I are living in a world today that's governed and is thinking And all you get on TV is nothing in the world but that which has to do with political economy and government and commerce and art and the pomp and pride of man and the religion of man, if you please. All of that is to be brought low and the Lord Jesus Christ is to be exalted on this earth. He has not given his place today in government, or in society, or in business, or in art, or in the pomp and ceremony of the world, and even in the religion of the world. He has left out today. My friend, he's coming someday, and when he comes, they're going to all make for the caves of the earth. Now, I don't know whether man is ever a cave man or not, but he's sure going to be one in the future. He's going to make it back to the cave. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, and he'll go into the clefts of the rock. And now his message is, Cease ye from man, that's verse 22, whose breath is in his nose, for wherein he's to be accounted of. Don't put your confidence in man. Did you know you and I exhale, but we don't know whether we're going to inhale the next breath? That's all man is today. Just A little breath. He messes one breath, and he's through. He's out of the picture. And multitudes today, heart trouble hits them just in a moment, and they disappear from the earth's scenes. Don't put your confidence in man. Put your confidence in Jesus Christ today. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, if you're taking that invitation to turn to Jesus to heart, we rejoice with you. It's the best decision that you can ever make. And we'd love to give you more information about what it means to put your trust in Jesus. Just visit ttb.org and search for How Can I Know God? Or email us at biblebus at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. And we'll put a few of these free resources in the mail to you. I sure hope that you were touched by the letters that I read at the beginning of our study. You know, when you write to us, your testimony of how God is using through the Bible in your life means so much to all of us. If you've never written, and that's probably most of you actually, or maybe if it's been a while, how about doing so now? Would you encourage someone else with how God has encouraged you by simply telling your story? Again, our email address is biblebus at ttb.org or mail your note to box 7100. 
Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Next time, we'll continue our journey through Isaiah. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here waiting for you to hop aboard. Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed at what God teaches you from his word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.